Marie de France was one of the uh, uh, more significant poets of the late Middle Ages in Europe, working within the so-called courtly tradition, um, aristocratic, um, uh, aristocratic audiences, probably aristocratic authors. Uh, we don't know that much. We know, well, we know essentially nothing about Marie de France as an individual. Uh, there are lots of theories about who she is. Was she the daughter of Eleanor Aquitaine? Was she uh, attached to the, uh, to the court in some, some lesser capacity? Um, nobody knows. Uh, there's a lot of speculation. It really doesn't matter to me. I don't care at all. Um, all that we really know about her is what we can glean from her writings. And uh, we know this, through this, we know that she was uh, probably born in France and she lived in England uh, at the time they were well, France and England have always been uh, fighting back and forth. Uh, and so there was an awful lot of uh, cross currents, and especially starting in uh, from 1066, when you get a whole sweep of uh, French speakers into, uh, into what is now England. Um, she appears to be quite highly educated, uh, unusual for a woman. Um, she is multilingual. She has some English. She's, uh, she's writing in old French uh, and she claims to know some Latin. Um, enough uh, to know enough that she's uh, that she might be uh, the, that she's considering translating it. So that gives you a sense of mastery. Um, the fact that she was so well educated does suggest that she was uh, of nobility. Uh, common people really had no education uh, at all, so this is a significant uh, little fact um, that we can glean from it. Um, but other than that, we really know nothing at all. She says at one point in her writing, you know, my name is Marie, I am from France. Okay, that's all we really have. That's all we really know. And that's not much to go on. But honestly, again, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, who really cares? Um, whoever she is, good. You know, maybe somebody's going to come up with some evidence sometime. Maybe somebody will write a really compelling book about it. I'm sure she's a fascinating figure, and I'd love to read that book. But for understanding and appreciating the, uh, the poems, it really doesn't matter to me. Um, what matters is the poems themselves. And she was working within a fairly well established tradition, but it was one that was very dynamic too. It was developing all the time. She's working in the Arthurian tradition to a certain degree, um, although only one of her poems that we have, one of her lays, songs, uh, really deals with um, King Arthur, but you get a lot of, uh, she's one of the figures that you get uh, at that time where you get a lot of Arthurian, um, Chrétien de Troye, obviously he's the big one, uh, but you get Tristan, um, uh, those stories, Lancelot, Guinevere, um, all of these stories around the uh, the court of King Arthur of France and this mythical legendary um, uh, administration um, she doesn't get into she's she's not writing um, the romances that uh, Chrétien does of Lancelot and Guinevere and all of those guys. Hers are much more short. They're much more compact. Uh, they do seem to be written, uh, scholars believe, uh, to be read. Um, but there is a, uh, but her work also lends itself to an oral performance. Uh, she tends to write in very short lines, um, tight rhyming schemes. 
and um, uh, a, a kind of a playfulness throughout that suggests that it could be performed uh, just as well as read. The um, um, some of the uh, the key aspects that come out from her. And one of the more interesting ways of looking at her is the fact that she was a woman and she is allow or she is putting in a different perspective than you find in Chrétien. And it's not necessarily that she's a rebel, she's not a bra burning feminist or whatever, but there are certain elements, certain themes that seep into her work that is, seem to question the uh, the role of women in society. There's a uh, um, a uh, openness to that that you don't see very often in uh, in a lot of the other male writers that we know of the time. And this begins honestly. Her collected works are gathered together, and they have a prologue. Um, feeding to all of them, where she lays out her uh, agenda for uh, for writing. Hold on one second. Sorry. Uh, in the prologue, notice how she begins. Uh, this is my page two ninety seven. Um, this is also a pretty good version. Uh, whom God has given intelligence and the great gift of eloquence must not conceal these or keep still, but share and show them with good will. Now, put aside the, uh, um, the rhyming of it. Nice tight rhymes, couplets. Um, just think about of every way that she could have begun this, she started like that. She started almost defiantly, assertively feminine, uh, almost. Even a woman, you could say, whom God has given intelligence. Because why would a woman write anything? Why would uh, anybody read anything written by a woman? But she says, no, I have intelligence. So, I have a duty under God to share that. Um, must not conceal these or keep still, but share and show them with good will. It's kind of defiantly assertive and it's um, demanding a place at the table. She's not going to be silent. Uh, there's something quite shocking in that. Um, She, uh, she goes on to cite Priscian among the ancients custom was. Priscian can testify to this. The Middle Ages in Europe were very much steeped in the uh, Greco-Roman tradition, uh, more Rome than Greece, because they really didn't, there weren't that many people who could read Greek at this point, but their, uh, um, their heritage from the, uh, the Roman Empire was really quite pronounced. Um, hence, she mentions uh, her, uh, her understanding of Latin. But more than that, just she talks about the, uh, the role of, uh, of writing style, honestly, that in their books they made obscure much that they wrote. It's true. If you read some of the, uh, some of the authors of the earlier Middle Ages, let's say, um, they can be really quite obscure, especially when you're getting into the philosophy and the theology, which honestly was most of what was being written at the time. Um, it could be very dense and really tough sledding to get through, honestly, as a reader. The, uh, the expectation was that if you are reading this, then you have read miles and miles of other words all on the same topic, all dwelling in on this. So they're very elusive. They're assuming you have a broad base of knowledge and you are one of the clubs so you can keep up. Uh, they do not make it easy. 
the sentences tend to be long and extraordinarily complex, and the um, uh, the references are just innumerable. Um, but she's acknowledging this, and again, this is a, a an important point. By acknowledging it, she kind of points out that this is significant, and a great uh, characteristic of the Middle Ages uh, in, uh, in general is that it was enormously complicated uh, for, uh, well, it was enormously complicated reading and deliberately so. Um, in order to ferret out the truth of what you see on the page that is so complex and, and confusing at times, uh, you need to really refine your reading skill. You need to be made an expert. And you only do that by more study, by really digging into a lot of other books, all of those miles and miles and miles of words. And so by doing so, by straining to see what the meaning is buried in all of those words, it's a kind of religious devotion. Because the, uh, the practice of religion for the Middle Ages was trying to make sense of the world around them, trying to understand what was going on, trying to look around at God's creation and see, well, okay, how do I find evidence of God's hand in this? Because the world was bewildering to them. They didn't have, uh, they didn't have much uh, scientific knowledge at all. And just trying to understand, to see through all the complicated patterns of reality, to try and discern some element of divine will or just purpose in the world, uh, that was a primary uh, goal of the Middle Ages. And reading, it was the practice for that. Reading very complicated texts, prepared you for that because it was exercise in having to think critically about what you're coming across in trying to get a uh, an idea of the truth within or underneath what you see. Um, Savants and scholars were aware that in their strivings more and more they sensed the work's great subtlety increasingly as time went by. Here we see this is this is the project of the liberal arts. You sharpen your mind by cracking it up against the, some of the most complicated uh, material you can find. Um, thus, I, he who would uh, keep from vice and sin must great arduous work begin. If you do not work, then hmm, idle hands of the devil's playground or whatever it is and you will be led astray. So you must be work, 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 work. Um, who he who would keep from vice and sin must some great arduous work begin. Struggle and study, strive to know, and doing so avoid much woe, free from great suffering and regret. Uh, it's almost a mission. It's not really something she's choosing so much it's something she feels called to do, almost like a religious vocation. Thus I began to give some thought to telling some good story that, taken from Latin, I would put into French. Um, what we have at this little line is a tip that, well, Latin was sort of falling away. In the later Middle Ages, the rise of the vernacular languages was really taking shape and it was becoming uh, increasingly prominent in, in literature. Writers were more and more saying that, well, you know, we, we don't want to just write in Latin. Uh, we think that our little home, uh, our local language, uh, often a derivation of Latin, uh, is just as good. So old French, yeah, there's, there's some poetry there. There's some flexibility. You don't have to write in Latin. We can write in uh, French. And then the advantage then is that, well, you get a new freedom creatively, but also you have the opportunity to reach a somewhat wider audience. Um, you still don't have great, even in vernacular languages, you still don't have great uh, uh, literacy rates. 
but it becomes a sense of national pride. And you see these uh, territories emerging out of the old feudal system, coalescing into nations, essentially. Italy, France, Germany, uh, England, all developing their own languages and uh, all grappling with that sense of identity and trying to assert themselves in the world. Um, so here she says, well, you know, I, I was, my first thought, I, I wanted to tell some stories and I feel like I owed it to, uh, to, the, to uh, something because I am so smart and I, I, uh, I have a duty to do this. So her first thought was, well, I'll just go translate some Latin. Says, yeah, that's what you do. Um, but then I would win no glory there, so much is done. She's coming kind of late to the game. By the later Middle Ages, a lot of Latin had already been translated and yeah, been there, done that. Uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't that big of a demand for it. So she was uh, realizing that, you know, I, I want a little attention. You know, what, what can make me stand out? What can make me special? Translating Latin, does anybody really need that? Um, but, hmm, maybe something from the French tradition. But then I would win no glory there. So much is done. She wants to be new. She wants to be relevant. A little ego in the game. She's striving for fame and recognition. Um, I thought of lays that I had heard and did not doubt. I felt assured that these first writers who began these lays, who told them, made them known, wished for remembrance to record adventures, stories they had heard. So she's taking oral stories. She's digging back into essentially the folk traditions of the French countryside and saying, well, okay, you know, um, what are some good stories? People have always told stories and only a fraction of them ever get written down. So the, um, the, uh, the, the impulse here is to cull together some stories from what people are saying, an oral tradition, and start writing them down. In a sense that's preserving them, um, in a sense that is uh, developing them and amending them, and certainly she is doing that, just like every oral poet we've seen, they take some found materials and say, okay, well, what can I do with this? How can I shape this? I have the good raw material, but now I'm going to put my own spin on it. Um, so she lays out this project for herself. And because she is, it is assumed, uh, a, a part of some royal court, um, she addresses it and dedicates it to the king. This is a way of, you know, kissing up to the king, getting a, a little favor in the court, always very important in politics, uh, but also to you know, preserve a little distinction and shine a little bit of a light on her work. She's very interested in self-promotion here. She's very conscious of that. And quite frankly, she's demanding it because Plenty of other poets get that. And why shouldn't she? Just because perhaps she is a she. To honor you, most noble king, courtly and skilled in everything, to whom all joy makes obeisance, in whose heart roots all excellence, to gather lays I undertook, to rhyme, make, tell, this was my work. Again, that simple declaration, this was my work. It has value. There's something really quite impressive about that. This was my work. I, in my heart, thought this I do, fair sire, present this work to you. If it should please you to receive my gift, for all the days I live, I shall be joyful. Ooh, all the days you live? Now that she's famous. You shall give great happiness. Do not believe me proud, presumptuous, He's kind of uh, maybe aware of how this can be received, and she doesn't want to step too far outside the bounds of what is acceptable for a woman. But here as I begin my tales, give ear, which is 
slightly awkward way of saying, listen to me. Um, again, it's a demand. It's, oh, it's, it's confident. It's impressive. The stories themselves that she tells, the lays, the poems, the songs, if you will, um, again, they can be sung. Uh, are largely, as she suggests, uh, repurposed elements of, uh, of stories that have been around for a while. They're, for the most part, they're all stock characters and situations that she just rearranges a little bit and, you know, dresses up in different, uh, in different guises. Um, a lot of them have a strong folktale quality. A lot of them have um, elements of fairy tales. Um, and this, um, this gives them a, a very artificial look to it, uh, or feel. They, uh, and, and this is sort of important before you jump in, uh, they're not supposed to be anything but artificial. The artificiality is kind of the point. Um, and it has a theological anchor to it. Um, all of this does sort of look like a once upon a time thing. It doesn't make any pretenses of that. It actually kind of revels in it at times, and we'll see. It is trying to be very fake, very false, very, you know, uh, you know, oh, it's all just silly. Um, uh, artificiality, um, non-representational, uh, or non-identifiable renderings in art uh, was the medieval way in Europe, especially in the later Middle Ages, when you don't want, you want it to be conspicuous that the, um, the artificial is artificial because artificiality is supposed to remind you of the falseness of this world. Everything in this world is naturally artificial because the real truth, the, the, the only honest validity in this world is God and in the afterlife, in heaven. So you have this, uh, this, recurrent uh, effort to never make anything look too real, to never have it be too uh, recognizable, too realistic. Uh, it needs to be sort of plastic and one-dimensional. Um, and a lot of people find that kind of off-putting, especially when you get into it like, what? what? I, these don't seem like real people. How can I get into this? Well, it's kind of the convention. But on the other side of that coin, you also have this um, asserting uh, humanism, this pressure, this demand for the recognition that what, what is on this world is of value. Like she says in the prologue, this is my work. It has value. And, well, no, nothing, and nothing other than God has value on earth. Well, no, my work has value. I'm a human being just as anybody else, any man, and my work has value. So you see these two poles at war between um, artificiality as a kind of uh, dogmatic imperative, nothing in this world is, you know, worth anything, and this burgeoning humanism on the other pole that says, no, my life, my identity has value as a human being um, and deserves some recognition. <laughs> and you see that again and again and again in all of these stories, and that kind of makes them fun. And once you can understand that dynamic working, up, working, it makes it a little easier to crack into them and see what's going on, because otherwise sometimes it, the stories can be just a little bit too bizarre and too you know, silly sometimes to really um, get drawn in. But the underlying tensions, once you start listening to it, you can't help but hear it 
throughout. And that makes it much more entertaining to read. So bisclavre, bis I hate pronouncing that. For some reason, it just sticks in my tummy. I just can't do it. But I'm going to try, and I'm going to fail. So get used to that. Um, a nice little story. Um, very, uh, um, very fairy tale-ish, again. Um, this guy or in, and this woman uh, marry, and everything seems perfect at first. But one thing she found most vexing, though, during the week, he'd disappear for three whole days. She knew not where. Um, again, that is line, like, 25. So fairly close up to the start. Um, you have to be aware that everything that gets cited, especially in something that's so short and compact as this, um, everything that gets cited, every little detail, every choice that gets made is very, very deliberate. They don't have acres and acres of, uh, of story time to lard in all sorts of details just for detail's sake. These are very selected. So he disappeared for three whole days. She knew not where. It's a it's from her perspective. He disappeared for three whole days. He knew where he was. Um, this is from her perspective, though. Not something you get terribly often. She knew not where. That point is very deliberately made. And she confronts him about it. Oddly uh, assertive again. My, my fair sweet friend, she said, fair sire, if I, if I just dared, I'd ask you a thing I dearly w wish to know, except that you're so, I'm so full of fear of your great anger, husband dear. You know, maybe not everything is so uh, copacetic here. Maybe this isn't the wonderful marriage that on the surface you might assume it to be. Um, they're both supposed to be very elegant, very beautiful, all of this picture-perfect stuff, but now suddenly you get this little note here that um, perhaps things aren't quite the way they seem. Behind closed doors, anybody can, anybody's guess, really. Um, of course, she presses him, he doesn't want to say anything. And it comes out somewhat casually, almost, after pressing and pressing. Um, that he turns into a werewolf. <laughs> you really can't say that without uh, without cracking cracking up just a little bit. Uh, but they have this long fight about how they uh, uh, he doesn't want to tell her. He doesn't want to share that with her. He doesn't trust her with that knowledge and she convinces him now when the wife was thus addressed it seemed to her to be no jest off time she begs with all her skill coaxing and flattering until at last he told her all he did the tale entire kept nothing hid again it didn't just say that while well, they fought and he broke down and told her it specifically referenced that with her skill, with her ability of rhetoric, of language, to convince him, to coax him, coaxing and flattering until at last he did tell the tale entire. She had to um, drag it out of him. Women always have more agency in, uh, in Marie de France. They control things. They do things. They're not just the pretty, you know, stock character off in the corner who everybody fights for. Um, she brings it out. And she does it through her rhetorical skill, her intelligence. So it, it comes out that, okay, I disappear for uh, three days every month or so, and uh, I become a werewolf. Oh, really? Well, that's interesting. Um, I kind of like the line, oh, 
I'll not tell you. Uh, well, she asks. Uh, uh, when she told him the whole affair, she uh, when he had told her the whole affair, she persevered. She asked him where his clothes were. Was he naked there? Lady, he said, I go all bare. Mm -hmm. Tell me, for God's sake, where you put your clothes. It's an odd focus on the clothing. Why? I'm not sure. Uh, oh, I'll not tell you that. Again, he's told her this much. Uh, why are you holding back on this? It's again a sign of uh, a refusal to trust. He does not open up to her. He is being, in a sense, disloyal to her because he's not honoring a basic tenet of any relationship is trust in the other person even in you know a deeply patriarchal medieval society um she asked you know sire she said uh, said that his lady in reply more than all earth i love you why hide why have secrets in your life why why mistrust your own dear wife again this is the point she's drilling in on the fact that he's you know becoming a werewolf it's just completely off to the side um You can make a couple of arguments about that because the way he puts it, uh, he becomes a bisclavre, French. Uh, he, I, dame, I become a bisclavre in the deep forest, in the great forest. I'm afoot in deepest woods near thickest trees and live on prey I track and seize, which is very wild. Um, it's almost like, uh, you know, the wildness within himself a kind of barbarity almost that he can clothe himself in great civilization and sophistication and you know I'm man of the world I'm very cultured but underneath my exterior you find this wild interior this bestial um, heart of man and you can also quite frankly read um, as it develops, there are some, there are legitimate uh, critiques of this saying, well, it's got kind of homoerotic overtones sometimes. This guy just disappears from his wife, whom he can't open up to. He just disappears for a weekend, once a month, and talks about how, well, I just go crazy, and yeah, I'm naked the whole time. Something's a little strange there. Uh, there, you can go crazy with stuff like that, but uh, I'm not going there. But <laughs> the clothing thing comes back because she goes and she steals his clothing, and it's apparently the clothing that allows him to change back into a human being. He needs to sh shield his bestial side and to re-enter the world of man. And of course. Um, the werewolf uh, lives in the woods continuously as a werewolf and until he comes across the king uh, the king is out hunting or something and comes across him and essentially adopts him and again there's some weird bonding going on between the king and the werewolf as you know or the uh, this lord who is a werewolf now um, that has some overtones, which, you know, you, you, whatever you want to read into that, go nuts. But the king notices when he has a, uh, when he has a little carnival, when he has a party, and the, uh, and the neighbor, uh, his old neighbor, uh, an old friend, perhaps, uh, who had... Uh, taken up with his wife at the same time that the wife betrayed the uh, betrayed the uh, the werewolf. Uh, when he comes to visit the castle, the werewolf just <laughs> attacks him. Just Rawr! and everybody says, "Wow, you know this this wolf has always been so sweet. He's always been so tame and loves everybody. He's like a little puppy dog more than a wolf." And but this guy. Something's wrong. What's what's going on? You know, they're trying to judge the behavior and see what's going on underneath. And 
Um, that goes away. And then later on, when they're out and they, they encounter the woman, they find the woman and the wolf goes nuts again. And they, uh, they start to deduce. They start to say, well, you know, just based on appearances, on what we can see, the, uh, there's something going on beneath the surface. We need to get to the bottom of this. We need to investigate. So, of course, the first thing that they think to do is, well, let's take the woman and we'll torture her. Put her to torture. She may state something, this dame, to indicate why the beast feels for her such haste. Force her to speak. She'll tell it straight. They don't torture the guy whom she's with. Uh, whom she doesn't even, you know, seem to much love. She just sort of says, yeah, all right, well, uh, my husband's a, uh, a wolf now, so, you know, if you want to come over, sure. Um, very ambivalent about it. But their first go-to is, well, let's torture the woman. She wasn't even the first person that they noticed the wolf had a problem with. Um, and they figure out the whole bit with the clothes. Uh, so they, uh, they take the clothes, they put the, uh, they put the, uh, the wolf in a, in a room with the clothes. They leave him alone to be quiet for a little while. They want him to have his privacy. And then they come back and they find this guy, uh, you know, buck naked asleep. And they figure, oh, he's human again. Uh, I guess this was, uh... I guess this was true, this little legend. Um, and it's a story that emphasizes uh, loyalty again and again. It mentions it throughout. And the idea that the wolf is very loyal to the king. And that is very prized. And it is a sign of loyalty to the wolf that the king exercises in saying, well, no, we're going to... You know, we're, we'll just leave him his privacy to um, to get dressed at his own pace. Um, and the king is the Deus Ex Machina figure here, where he comes in and he he sees that not everything is quite right, and he figures out what is wrong. And he says, "Okay, here's what we're going to do to make it right," and then he makes it right, and then he punishes the. Uh, punishes the bad people, um, he, uh, what is it, uh, they get rid of the, uh, uh, well, they restore his lands to the Lord, the, uh, to the wolf, to the werewolf, they restored his lands, more he bestowed than I can tell, so he gave him more than he had originally. Uh, his wife was banished. She was chased out of the country in disgrace and chased out, traveling with her, her mate and co-conspirator. Quite a few children had this dame, who in their way achieved some fame. For looks, for a distinctive face, numbers of women of her race, it's true, were born without a nose. Now that's a reference to the fact that he cut off her nose. The king had her disfigured, uh, mutilated. Um, she is said to be quite beautiful at the beginning, so they slice off her nose to make her hideous. And that's really quite visceral and strong. And it's, again, a sense of almost disproportionate to what is going on here. At least that's my sense. And... There is great emphasis on how she was not loyal to her husband. But in that, you can't consider that question without wondering about, well, you know, what about loyalty to her? What about justice for her? It started at the very beginning because the husband was just skipping out for three days every month and not, not telling her anything. He wouldn't open up to her. He wouldn't trust her. He just, you know, didn't think that she had any right at all to know. So 
all of that began because of this. And yeah, maybe she did not act completely on the up and up. But if you're judging the man, or if you're judging the wife, you have to judge the husband by the same standards here, or do you? The, here the society very clearly is not, because by any, by any measure, there's, uh, there's injustice on both sides. There is mistrust and distrust on both sides. Um, there is a s severe lack of loyalty on both sides, but only one is punished for it. She is singled out, she is mutilated, and she is made a sense, uh, in a sense, a, um, a hideous monster, just like the werewolf. Uh, but hers is a little bit more real, it seems, a little bit more visceral. Nobody seems to care that, oh, he's a werewolf. It just sort of goes away. This supernatural quality is just sort of there. Like, it's just a plot device to get things moving. Um, it really doesn't dwell on that. That whole last paragraph really doesn't, or stands, it doesn't deal with uh, the fact that he's a werewolf at all. It just, you know, one day he, he, he wasn't a werewolf anymore, I guess. It just doesn't matter. The text doesn't address that, but it does address the justice, the punishment, the uneven nature of it. Um, the focus of the whole story is on injustice. But here, it also just pushes that aside deliberately into the realm of the artificial because it says, you know, it's true we're born without a nose, noseless they live, the story goes. So right there they re-emphasizing, as they did at the beginning, that this is just a story. Once upon a time, this is all just silly stuff, who knows what it is, you know. I'm not telling this story, you know, I didn't make it up. Uh, it's just something that, you know, everybody, it's around, I heard it, who knows, people are saying. And, you know, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a story. It's so fake. It's artificial. It's silly. Forget about it. It's silly, but it's getting at a very fundamental dynamic within the culture that women are not valued at all in this society. And then they double down on that. And this same story you have heard truly occurred. Don't doubt my word. Well, you, whenever somebody tells you, you know, believe me, or don't doubt my word, I'm going to doubt their word. So it kind of objectifies itself right there. It suggests that, well, maybe we should think twice about this. Maybe this isn't something that we can just take so uh, automatically. But it's troubling. And they're saying, you know, it's true. Is it? It's a story. What? You're not sure how to take it. So it's lingering in your the back of your head. And maybe you believe it. Maybe you don't. But the details of it are just sort of curious. They're uncomfortable. And they fester in the back of your head in a way that gives the author, um, who is trying to make her way in a very uh, male-dominated uh, aristocratic society that does not want to trouble the waters at all. They kind of like the way things are, the way, you know, when you're in the royal court, uh, you figure that, well, okay, the way society is set up is pretty good. Let's not rock that boat. She's protecting that. She's giving herself some deniability here, um, saying, you know, wow, it's just a story. I heard it. Um, but it is shifting that story into a very ambiguous frame that makes you question it all the more. The other story that they include here is uh, Lostig. It's another story of um, a uh, husband and wife loyalty, betrayal. Um, uh, it's, it's a little bit more of a straight up and down um, story of marital infidelity. Marital infidelity was a pretty standard trope of these things. Think again about, you know, uh, Guinevere and Lancelot. Uh, Guinevere was married to King Arthur. King Arthur was an old man. Uh, Lancelot was the young stud on the, uh, at the round table. And 
Mm -hmm. Nature takes it makes it nature takes its course. Same thing, Tristan and Isolde, you know, unrequited love or you know, lovers who are uh, essentially cheating. But in a world of uh, aristocratic arranged marriages, it's not all that uncommon. And most marriages at that level would be made for um, political benefit, uh, financial benefit. You know, I'm going to marry. I'm a dad. I'm going to marry my daughter off to the, uh, you know, a nobleman of a rival uh, kingdom so that maybe we can, you know, strike an alliance, a business arrangement. We're not going to go to war so much this way. You know, eh, we can't go to war. It'll get uncomfortable at Thanksgiving. Um, so there's that. There's that is a standard trope of these sorts of uh, stories. Um, but it's a little bit more uh, it's a little bit more subtle than that because it has this uh, this this little device of the nightingale um, the nightingale that sings a song and the uh, the lovers listen to it at their bedroom windows on opposite sides of a wall and uh, it transports them. They are um, uh, enraptured almost by, uh, by the beauty of it. Uh, and the way that they speak of that is, is very indicative of um, the culture of courtly love to begin with. It's very, um, very artificial of uh, very uh, formal. Um, on my page 307, around line 57 or so, for a long time they loved each other until one summer when the weather had made the fields and forest green and gardens, orchards bloom again, all very symbolic of springtime, youth, uh, sexuality, uh, uh, fruitfulness um, above the flowers to great joy small board small birds sang sweetest melody he whose desire for love is strong no wonder that he heeds their song it has a certain uh, symbolic value uh, going on here and also the way they talk about love is not necessarily that um, that they love another person so much. They love being in love. It's a little different, it's very subtle. And the nightingale takes, uh, takes such prominence in this because he is a symbol of love. He is a, uh, he is a symbol, he needs to be interpreted, he needs to be understood, read into, um, deconstructed, if you will. Um, But it's about being swept off in love and not necessarily uh, getting the object of that love, which in the end, they don't. The, uh, there is a ritual murder. Um, uh, the little bird was destroyed by her husband, who in a jealous rage crushed the bird when he thought that this was a, uh, a symbol of her love for this other man. And they, uh, he sends the bird in a, uh, or they, the, the bird, uh, the bird is given a, put in a very special box, very jeweled, very ornate, very beautiful. And it is sent to the, uh, the lover across the way. And, um, Tiny reliquary he soon had forged for him to carry, not iron nor, nor steel, pure gold with stones most rare and precious, lovely ones. Nothing common about this, nothing particularly um, ugly about this. This is just very, very um, ornate and precious. A lid that was a perfect fit, the little bird was placed in it. The vessel sealed, the chevalier carried it with him everywhere. 
So it is, it's less about it. That's, that's how it ends essentially. Um, it's less about the woman itself than the symbol of his love, than the, um, the act of devotion for devotion's sake. Um, they don't necessarily know one another all that well. They don't have a, you know, fantastic, you know, give and take scene where you can see that, well, yeah, they should be together. Um, but they're both in love with being in love. They are both devoted to the idea of love, the ideal of love, love as a, uh, a kind of perfection on this earth. And here you get to the point of all of this stuff because by um, singling out something so special, something so precious, something so perfect as love. And that's sullying it with, you know, who you actually love. Um, you are participating in a kind of religious ritual because it's not about love. It's not about, you know, finding somebody that you want to you know, sit up and talk to in the middle of the night or somebody who's going to help you, you know, when you're sick. Um, this is about participating in an ideal. This is about a kind of worship. And the ideal is God in this. Love is a, to be in love, to practice love in a performative way is about worshiping God. And it brings you to that same place where it inspires you, where it drives you to do great, great things. But you never really know. It is unrequited. It has to be. The uh, love stories never particularly work out well. And you can say that, well, you know, all of these marriages, they, you know, they're, they're all extramarital affairs. They're all born to, you know, born to go wrong. And well, yes and no. Some of that's, again, historical. Um, but we can't on earth know God. We can only deduce what we see around here. We can try and read into the reality we see in our life, a presence of the divine. And that's unrequited love. That is the ability to feel inspired to do all this stuff, to want to dedicate yourself to that act of worship, to just, you know, forever holding on to that precious relic of a love that you cannot hold, a devotion, a worship that is necessarily mysterious because it's only one way that you can really ascertain. So love is held up as a participation in God, a participation in an ideal world, a platonic ideal. It's going back to Plato and the uh, whole parable of the cave and all of that stuff. The sense that this world is false, that this world is just less than it should be. But that participation in God, communication with God, acting and worshiping in a way that puts you in some sort of give and take with the divine, that's valuable. That has worth. And that tension you can see coming up against everything in there where you're seeing like, well, again, we have a story of a girl with a, or, you know, probably a young girl whose marriageable age was generally fairly young, probably 13 or so. Um, often their husbands are somewhat tyrannical. Uh, often you can only assume that they are married for non-romantic reasons. Um, and compatibility itself was probably really the last thing on their minds. But <clears throat> the one thing that when you're stuck in a situation where you have no control and when you see everything around you 
you know, is so uninspiring. The one thing you always have is what's within you. A sense of the divine, a sense of a special purpose in life, perhaps, a sense of an ideal. And the participation in that can get you through all of the hard times that when life itself is so disappointing. And that's what the literature does. That's what these stories do. They lead you on and show you another way to uh, reach God. But in the act of telling them, they're also sharing stories and personalities and perspectives and opinions about this world, about the unfairness of it, the difficulty of it, the pain and suffering of it, that maybe it's supposed to make you appreciate the perfection of God even more. But that's a hard lesson to learn every day. Every day. And the telling of stories can allow you an expression of that pain, can allow you an identification of that pain with others, give you a sense of commonality, of communion, of shared purpose, shared frustration. And they can slowly, slowly, nudge this artificial pointless human life just a little closer to some notion of the ideal.